Hello all sentient beings and welcome to Transmissions Alt Mode where we talk all news, comics, and media related to the... On this episode of Transmissions Alt Mode, we review Star Trek vs. Transformers Issue 1. Today you can order a new Respect the Prime EP and we have the full list of Transformers artists attending New York City Comic Con. Today is Friday, September 28th, 2018, and this is episode 96 of Transmissions Alt Mode. Welcome to Transmissions Alt Mode, the podcast that's going boldly where no Transformers have gone before. I'm your host, Charles, a.k.a. Big C, and I'm joined by the excellent Transmissions team. Yusuf, better known as Yoshi. Yo! Jeremy, a.k.a. Yakko. Hey, how you doing? And Daryl, the Cybertronian Beast. I think it should have been boldly going, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk Transformers. All right. Anyway. <laughs> no more show for you. <laughs> We're going to start off, as we always do, with donations. And we've got three new donors. Thank you guys for coming on board. Dan... David and Anthony from TFU.info. You guys are awesome. Hey. Who was established in the last show as being the best out of everyone. <laughs> Just kidding. We love you, though. Well, you know, Daryl, you can always put together your own site that has <laughs> a comprehensive database of pretty much every figure ever made. No, it's good. I'm good. <laughs> I think Anthony he's he's earned his respect. Yeah. <laughs> Anthony, you're awesome. Thanks for also having us on your podcast a couple of times. I think uh, each of us have had little cameos at, at different points and uh, keep doing what you're doing. You know, you've been an awesome uh source for the Transformers fan community for a long time. All right, so uh, these people have joined the fold, the ranks of our Donatrions, and we've we've got lots of perks uh, for our uh, our special Donatrions, our the folks who contribute to the show. Uh, we, in order to to have you a further enticement, we've got a special offer that we're running throughout uh, till the end of September, which is very close now. As uh, as this show goes up, there's only two more days left in September. But Jeremy, tell us about that special offer. Yes, um, we give out pins at conventions. When you meet us, you would get, say, a Charles pin or a Daryl pin. But we know it's hard for people to get to conventions, and it's hard for all of us to get to the same convention, Charles. Hey. but <laughs> <laughs> It's not my fault. I, I know. Anyway, so we're doing a limited time thing. If you want to get all five pins, uh, the, these are slightly smaller um, than our normal ones, but you're getting a full set of five pins. Get each of us plus editor Mike, the, the, uh, fifth beetle, and you'll just get a full five, full set of all five. They're, they're suitable for sticking on whatever you would put a pin on. We don't, we don't judge. You can put on whatever you want. And yeah, so I think they're great. All right. So yeah, join at the, the $10 level. That'll, those pins will come straight to you. And everyone who's already at the $10 level will get them as well. So, uh, yes, we love you. Yeah, and this is new, new people on Patreon. Existing people can be on PayPal or Patreon and, uh, it ends at the end of the month. So this is kind of a one time thing. We were in this trial that Patreon is doing and, you know, we'd like to do stuff like this again, but, it's not guaranteed to happen. Mm -hmm. so. And we've also got some merchandise, new merchandise in our transmission store, right, Jeremy? We do. It is now the time of year where things get cold. So we have long sleeve shirts, uh, sweatshirts, and hoodies of our tape man design. That is uh, a blue shirt with a, a cassette player robot. Uh, you can get it in other colors if you want. You could do a dark gray if you want new tape man. But the, the classic one, um, is blue. And yeah, so you can get the short sleeve shirts if you want, but we're offering other, um, other designs. So keep you warm and rep the show. So. All right. Uh, and if you are a Donatrion, you can get the special store that gives you 20% off on all our stuff. Yes. Membership has its benefits. 
privileges, whatever. <laughs> Uh, all right. So another perk of uh, being a Transmissions Donatrion is getting access to our monthly Declassified show, Transmissions Declassified. This month of September, we are doing continuing our series on the IDW comics, going through and, and doing a retrospective from the beginning. We started with the Asian series that was started by Simon Furman. And now in part two, we're doing All Hail Megatron. Uh, so Daryl and I sat down with Mikey from Moonbase 2 and uh, Josh from the Audio Nights Theater uh, to have a discussion about All Hail Megatron and, and does it hold up, you know, from 10 years ago when it was published. So that's a, it was a fun discussion. And we do have a little teaser, a little clip, so you can listen to it and see what you think. And there's more where this came from. Like I, I, I didn't talk about him, but Devastator is awesome in this. Like you can't fault him. You know, yeah. you're like it's a gigantic Godzilla construction warrior. Yeah. What? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. The gigantic Godzilla one is Trypticon. <laughs> oh God, I'm trying. Like the scale, the scale's just gone. There's no scale anymore. It's just <laughs> <laughs> one of the other humor bits that's in the sh- the uh, the series, and I f- I meant to mention it is um is uh when Prime and Megatron are starting to fight and. Prime starts going on about his, his, like, you know, freedom is, uh, and Megatron just says, oh, shut up, Prime. <laughs> <laughs> Next up, uh, another transmission's benefit of being a, a donor is becoming, uh, is, is getting entries into new contests. So, Daryl, we've got the, you don't have to go to Walmart contests. That that's the name we've got, right? So what what, we, what can you win with this contest? Well, we are giving away uh, a a bevy of reissue figures. Becoming a Donatrion gets you into the contest. Uh, at the duly appointed level, you get two entries uh, automatically. Uh, you don't have to do anything, but be a donor. That's all. Just be a donor, mm-hmm. Charles. Mm. Um, mm. So the contest is for a reissue Starscream, a reissue Devastator, and a reissue Bumblebee. Three different winners with three different prizes. Uh, we will be making uh, the cutoff for this is the end of September, so September the 30th at 11.59 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And the drawing will be made the first show in October. The first one we record in October, because I think we're going to record the first October show on that day. So right. we're going to have to so, wait. Right. It'll be uh, recorded on the 7th, I think. Yeah. Yes. Recorded on the 7th, releasing on the yeah. 10th. So you've got two more days to enter and just become a Donatrion. It's at, at, as little as a dollar, as much as whatever you want. <laughs> and uh, speaking of contests, we just drew the winner of our September Toy Hacks $10 gift code contest. So congratulations to longtime Donatrion Sergio for winning that contest. Uh, you can listen to that in uh, the transmission show this week, Transmissions 296. So without further ado, let's go to Comics News. All right, so we've got uh, some solicitations. IDW put out their December solicitations. Uh, since uh, the the main Transformers series have ended and they haven't really announced what's coming next, so this is kind of a transition period, so we don't have much going on. Uh, but there was a, a little bit of surprising news. So uh, what's coming out is, uh, of course, uh, Tom Scioli's GoBots. Uh, that issue number two will be out in December. Well... We'll see. <laughs> I don't know how much lead time he had. Uh, <laughs> we'll see if he makes that. Uh, also, Star Trek versus Transformers number four. So the final issue of that crossover will be out in December. Uh, and then another Transformers Bumblebee one shot. And this is going to tie into the recent really released uh, Bumblebee Win If You Dare graphic novel. Now they're, they are doing a, a sequel to that, uh, or maybe just a tie-in. It's called Bumblebee Go for the Gold. Uh, so they're they're creating this kind of mini uh, G1 pocket universe with these uh, with these comics. They're they're f- targeted at the younger reader, so there there's not really a focus on continuity. But it is set in the 80s, and the Autobots are in the arc. So it is. You could you could call it the Gold Label comics. 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, the... Never mind. Gold Gold Bug Comics? No, it's black label for DC with the whole Batman uh... Wang thing. Never mind. <laughs> you don't have any DC heads here. Sorry. Uh, I'll sit over here and just mutter to myself. Please do. <laughs> Uh, and then, uh, lastly, we've got a, a surprising announcement that there's going to be another uh, uh, book coming out called Transformers Historia. And this is a book that's written by Chris McFeely. So he's writing a, it's kind of a, uh, a summary or a, a retrospective of the entire IDW universe since it's just ended, uh, it will have just ended in October. And this book is a, uh, is a 48 page graphic novel that basically summarizes the whole universe with art selected from all the, you know, the, the 13 year run. Uh, and this is awesome. Chris announced this on, uh, on Twitter and he linked to the, um, to the, the previews page. You can pre-order it. Uh, and yeah, Chris is, I, I couldn't think of a better person to write, uh, a, a, a complete summary like this. Chris has been putting in all the work on the Transformers wiki to get these comics uh, cataloged and, and reviewed and uh, all the continuity notes entered and everything. So my hat's off to you, Chris. Congratulations. Uh, also, we've seen the cover that's going to be done. It's by Sarah Peter Duroche. Uh She's doing cover B and then Kay Zama is doing cover A for the book, but we haven't seen pictures of cover A yet, but. Uh, Sarah's cover is is pretty neat, and I'm sure Kazama's cover will also be pretty cool. I thought Sarah's cover was the I thought the Kazama thing was a, a misprint, and Sarah was doing the cover. Oh, I hadn't, hadn't heard that. Okay, well, Darren, well, I, I know in it in, in his announcements on YouTube, he only mentioned Sarah doing the cover. She's the only one who showed off any art. Anyway. All right, there's a confusion here. <laughs> but uh, congratulations, Chris. Uh, Yes, that's awesome. I'm looking forward. And, and to since it. he's he's not doing the the comic stuff on the wiki after this stuff ends, this is kind of like the culmination of all the work he's he's put into the wiki. Yeah, kind of preparing himself to do this. Yeah, and and another thing that's awesome is uh, in the solicits, it it specifically calls out the the basics. So his YouTube uh, his YouTube series mm -hmm. Transformers: The Basics. Uh, so if you haven't checked that out, you should definitely check that out on his YouTube channel. Those are, it, it, those are really nice, uh, about 10 minute videos that, that go into a, a Transformers topic and give you, you know, a really wealth of information in a short amount of time. He, he does a really good job on those. Uh, and I think, uh, both Jeremy and I are subscribed to his Patreon to, you know, to keep that going. So. All right, so uh, that's all the comics news. Uh, let's get into our comic review. And uh, this week we did leave the choice up to the Patreons about which comic they wanted to re wanted us to review this week. Uh, and they didn't give us a clear winner, so uh, I made an executive decision to pick Star Trek versus Transformers number one. That was one of the, I think there were three comics that were tied for with the most votes, so I picked that one. Transmissions wouldn't be what it is today without the awesome support of our listeners. If you'd like to support our shows and enjoy the exclusive benefits that our donors get, please visit transmissionspodcast.com slash support. Okay, we are reviewing Star Trek versus Transformers number one, Prime's Directive, part one. Written by John Barber and Mike Johnson. Art by Philip Murphy. Colors by Priscilla Tramontano. Letters by Krista Meisner. Edits by Chase Maratz and David Marriott. And publisher Greg Goldstein. We have a bunch of covers. Uh, cover A and cover B are two parts of a single image. Both by uh, Philip Murphy. On the cover A, which is the left side, that's the Autobots and the crew of the Enterprise facing off on cover B on the right side with the Decepticons and the Klingons. We've got the uh, one retailer incentive cover by Paulina Ganucho, It shows uh, Lieutenant M. Ress facing off against Ravage. And then the other retailer incentive cover by Derek Charm. 
It uh, features the crew of the Enterprise running forward with Prime in the background and the Enterprise in the background as well. So, uh, with these four covers, Yoshi, which one, uh, are you picking here? I pick the, uh, the retailer incentive cover B, the Derek Charm cover. All right. Any particular reason? Um, well, uh, I, I would have gone with, uh, covers A and B, except Windblade is in there and it destroyed it for me. And then, uh, there's actually nothing bad to say about uh cover the first uh RI cover other than uh I just kind of want a primary character in there. Mhm. I mean it's beautiful and and if honestly if either two of the RIs show up at my store I'll pick them up. Cool. Uh Daryl, which cover do you like? Well, the the one that Yoshi picked is pretty good, but I do like the uh the double spread there. It's uh hard to pick between one half of a two-sided image, but... And when's the last time we've seen Reflector? It's true. I pick cover A. All right. Jeremy, which one are you picking? Um, I like them all, but I pick uh, Retailer instead of B because both um, William Shatner and Nichelle Nichols are going to be at Wizard World Madison in December, and I would like to get them to autograph it and that's the only one that has Uhura on it. Nice. Good luck. I hope you're successful there. Yeah, well, yeah, that's not going to be cheap. When yeah. is uh <laughs> when is that convention? Uh I think it's in early December. All right. Well, I'll look for it for you if uh I can find it. Cool. All right. Uh I am also going to pick cover A because I like uh, how you've got Several Autobots and the Ark in the background and the Enterprise in the background, along with the crew of the Enterprise in the foreground. So I just like how that's all composed there. So that's cool. Uh, but I how d- awesome is that G1 Unicron or G1 Wind- Windblade? Yeah, she's pretty awesome. <laughs> you guys are gonna hate me at the end of this. <laughs> You've given us plenty of time to prepare for you. <laughs> all right, uh, so let's get into the story. Captain's Log, Stardate 5892.7 The Enterprise has been called to Cygnus 7, a remote dilithium mine dangerously close to the Klingon border. The miners have reported an increasingly hostile Klingon presence, culminating in the distress call that led us here. As the Enterprise orbits the planet Cygnus 7, Captain Kirk asks Lieutenant Uhura to report. Uhura can't raise the mining outpost on the comms. There's some sort of interference blocking subspace transmissions. Mr. Spock reports that there are no ships in the area, but something is preventing them from scanning the surface. So Kirk decides they'll investigate directly. Kirk takes Spock, Mr. Sulu, and cat-like Cation, Lieutenant Emress, and they beam down to the mining outpost location on the planet. When they materialize on the surface, they're in the middle of a war zone. What appear to be primitive 20th century Earth military aircraft are attacking the mining outpost. Kirk's team narrowly avoids getting blasted by the ships before they can take cover. Even curiouser, the aircraft appear to have no pilots. Kirk tries to contact the Enterprise, but the interference is still blocking any transmissions. The aircraft have noticed Kirk's team's arrival and intensify their ground assault. One blast blows a large hole in the mining outpost walls, allowing the miners to escape, but also exposing them to danger. The danger escalates when a 20th century Earth ground vehicle emerges from the dilithium mine. Kirk identifies it as a truck and throws himself on Lieutenant Emress to get her out of the path of danger. Kirk believes this truck is another threat working with the assaulting aircraft and that all these vehicles must be remotely controlled by the Klingons. However, Kirk doesn't seem to notice that the truck drives directly in the path of the aircraft's fire, shielding him and Emress from the blasts. Since Kirk assumes the truck is hostile, he fires his phaser to try and disable it. He scores a direct hit, and to everyone's surprise, the truck cries out in pain. Kirk and the others watch in amazement as the truck's shape changes into the form of a giant robot, the Autobot leader, Optimus Prime. He's not working with the attacking aircraft because they're his sworn enemies, the Decepticons. In gun mode, inside Starscream's cockpit, 
Megatron orders his Decepticons to press the attack and destroy Optimus Prime while he's wounded. Meanwhile, on the ground, Kirk has realized his mistake and tries to communicate with the injured Prime, but Prime quickly loses consciousness from his injuries. So Kirk turns his attention to the Decepticons, who have transformed into robot mode and landed in front of him. The Decepticons are not impressed with Kirk, and Megatron orders them to continue the attack. Soundwave unleashes a sonic assault, bringing Kirk and the team to their knees. But since Soundwave is now focusing on the attack, he's no longer jamming the communications. Kirk manages to contact Lieutenant Erex on the Enterprise and orders him to lock on to the giant robots and fire a photon torpedo at their location. The blast from the Enterprise in orbit knocks the Decepticons off their feet, and Kirk and crew fire their phasers in a counterattack. Megatron gives the order to retreat, and the Decepticons withdraw. As they leave, Soundwave reports that he detects another Decepticon signal on a nearby moon, and they go to investigate. On the moon, the Decepticons are surprised to find Trypticon in city mode. Not only that, but it's crawling with more humans. As the Decepticons approach, Megatron is ready to stomp on these intruders. But the creatures are indignant to be called humans because they're Klingons. Megatron senses an opportunity and decides to talk rather than fight. Klingon Commander Kuri explains that the humans have no right to mine dilithium in this sector and they attack the outpost. But a lucky shot from the outpost defenses disabled the Klingon starship and they had to get to, gr- they had to set ground on this moon. Megatron is also here for the dilithium mine and mentions that the humans brought reinforcements from something called the Enterprise. Curry knows that means his old enemy Kirk is here and he's ready to spill some blood. So of course, Megatron proposes a bad guy team up against their common enemy. Meanwhile, at the mining outpost, Kirk orders Mr. Scott and Dr. McCoy to come down to the surface to help figure out how to repair the giant robot they inadvertently damaged. But Bones is a doctor, not a mechanic. Kirk insists that there's something different about this robot. It's not just a machine. It appeared to have some kind of consciousness. He asks Mr. Scott and Dr. McCoy to work together to try and get the robot to wake up. As Scotty and Bones get to work, Mr. Spock detects energy readings in the mine similar to this robot. Kirk takes Sulu and Emres to investigate. As they go deeper into the mine, they find a wall composed of an unknown metal alloy with a mysterious symbol of a red face emblazoned on it. They can't get a clear reading of what's behind the wall, and Kirk proposes trying to cut through the, with their phasers. But before they can do anything, a blast from behind the wall blows it outward. More giant robots emerge. The one in the lead is surprised to find humans here of all places. He demands to know, what have they done with Optimus Prime? To be continued. So, yeah, this is a fairly generic uh, crossover introduction, so... I mean, I I don't know where the where the crossover is planned to go, but the 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 beginning is doesn't give me a lot of confidence. I mean, it's got all the tropes of your traditional crossover: the good guys accidentally fight amongst amongst each other, the bad guys team up. I'm sure the bad guys will be betraying each other uh, later on in the series. Um. I will say the art is very evocative of both the G1 cartoon and the uh, the Star Trek animated series, so I, I think it it works well uh, in terms of the the art composition. Uh, I just am wondering, you know, what how this how this story is going to to come together. So, uh, Yoshi, what were your thoughts? I didn't have as much trouble with the generic story as you did. I thought it was fun. I think this is just going to be a fun little nostalgic ride for most people. Uh, you, you managed to hit most of the, the, the Star Trek sayings that were done a lot, except for when Sulu said, Oh my. <laughs> <laughs> that was a nice little thing. But, you know, my, my negativity comes from the fact that, okay, this is, this is literally a book geared at me. And, and people in our age range, but they, they're including characters that weren't in the G1 thing. So you're going, you're going into this, you know, hopeful, and then you're seeing characters you don't, that weren't in it. And I, I, that bugs me. There, there was, there's absolutely no reason to do that. And it's, like I said, it's a fun story, but I, I feel like it's, it's not fair, I guess. Mm. 
And I'm surprised the red shirt hasn't died yet. <laughs> well, I think in the, in the animated, the Star Trek animated show, did people die very often? I think in the animated cartoon, they didn't die that much. I don't know all. that I would be upset if they did that, though. I mean, I don't know. I know I watched the animated series with my brother, but I, I can't tell you that specific, that specific thing about it. Mm-hmm. But I don't know. They, I, generic or not, for me, it was fun. I just, I don't know why they had to include characters that weren't in the original shows. I it just, I, I want that to be a Hasbro mandate or something that was outside of IDW's hands. And it's, it, it's, it's unfortunate that they had to do that or that they chose to do that for no reason. Well, I would say definitely Air Rachnid was not a hand Hasbro mandate because they don't have a toy of her out right now. And she's from a show that was like, that's been over for. All right. Like so it's IDW's years years at this point. Well, I think it's, if you want, it's, I don't, I don't, I think it was intentional. So it's not a fuck up. It's just that they wanted to do that. So it was stupid. Why would, why, why would they miss? I, I mean, it's, know. you're, 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 you're specifically writing and putting together a comic book for our demo and, and you're include. Yeah. I'm just yeah, but our myself. demo has been reading the IDW comics, so people accept these characters in the IDW comics as kind of grandfathered into G1 esque stories. Except for you, <laughs> <You're> except <the> for <laughs> me. I don't know. That that's like saying you know, Mister Poopy Butthole is part of the Rick and Morty family. It, it just well, it, it 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 was funny for one episode, and then they they don't do it anymore. I just it's I don't know. It's as, as somebody who just looks forward to wanting to throw his money at a, at a book that's geared towards me, it's un, it's unfortunate that they felt this was necessary. They, they could have not included them by that logic and it wouldn't have bothered anybody. Yeah. I don't, I mean, maybe John Barber just likes those characters. I don't know. Anyway, Daryl, what did you think? Um, <clears throat> okay. So I, I enjoyed the story. Um, I thought it was fun. Um, the uh, uh the relationship between Kirk and this Emrest, um he's fucking that cat woman, I think. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you, um, you you got that just because he he knocked her out of the way? <laughs> I I was Twice. thinking the same thing. <laughs> he's yeah, he's he's all over this cat woman. <laughs> so yeah, that's that's happening. <laughs> I, I noticed in the art, uh, when, uh, you see inside Starscream's cockpit, you see the, uh, um, the screen, uh, Grimzeek is on the screen there. Uh, so that's oh. a little, little tidbit I didn't there. I noticed that. Yeah, that's cool. But, uh, I, I love the art. I think the art's fantastic. It's really fun. They did a really good job. And one of the, my biggest critiques about, like, recent, uh, IDW books, especially like Revolution and stuff like that, has been throwing, you know, name badges and stuff like that beside the characters and really clogging up the art. You don't get this here. Everybody who's got a speaking role has their name kind of mentioned by a, a you know, a corresponding character. You know, Soundwave gets mentioned, you know, by Megatron or or something like that. And then Starscream says, you idiot, uh, Thundercracker, we need something like that. So you get everyone's name in the book except for Arachnid. So <laughs> so she's in this book. We're assuming she, that's Arachnid. You know, mm -hmm. th there is no name drop for this character yet. Yep. It's a hel helicopter that turns into a female character that is it's, probably spider spider arms. Arms. it's probably yeah. Blitzwing. Could be. <laughs> so, but there is no name drop of this, this, this character here. So we don't exactly know. We're assuming that it's Arachnid. It's a pretty good guess though. What was, else was I going to say? Um, the, when, when, uh, when Megatron comes upon the Klingons and calls them humans, right? And the fact that they're not humans, right? Is it fine? It's fine for Megatron now? Oh, you're not humans. Okay, cool. Let's work together. The fact that they're not human and just Klingons would make no difference to Megatron. <laughs> One set of squishy, you know, organic life for another, 
I can't imagine this making much of a difference at all to Megatron, right? Hum- human type character, yeah. So that that kind of got me. It's like no, you're not human. Okay, cool. We'll work together. Not does it, it doesn't matter that you don't look like humans at all. I think this is just a setup for the eventual betrayal. Like he's like, well, I can use these other humans, their grudge to you know help. They'll help me conquer the mine, and then I can just stomp on them and take right. everything. Mm-hmm. And, and and lastly, how powerful is Kirk's phaser? That it took down Optimus Prime. You know, it actually damaged him. Put a freaking hole in him. Obviously, he didn't use the stun setting. No. <laughs> like, it incapacitated Optimus Prime. It's That's quite the, quite the stun. Anyway, I, I thought the book was fun. It's, it's, you know, neat. It's the fact that Windblade is in there, it doesn't bother me. To the little part of my brain that's Yoshi screaming at me saying she wasn't part of the G1 cartoon. I, I just say she was off world the entire series. She was, you know, <laughs> yeah, she was on I mean, Caminus. She was there. She was there, you know. I like to think she was like just off screen. Yeah. The whole, <laughs> she the was whole there time. In the room. So yeah, I just, I, I rewrite my own canon in my head for it. Transformers has to make up new characters if they're going to survive. You can't always have the same characters. You bring up something that I was scratching my head about. Exactly, I, I can't remember, Charles. What about when in time does Star Trek occur? The original series. It's twenty uh, twenty third century. Twenty third century. Okay, yeah. so this is this is well after uh, two thousand fifteen, where Megatron becomes Galvatron. I mean, you got to give yourselves, or you got to give this book a lot of gimmies through the whole thing. And well, I mean, I think I think there's some time travel involved here because you know why are the Autobots and Decepticons still in 20th century Earth modes? Mm-hmm. This is just this is this is the cartoons plucked and put into a story. They're Basically. not going to explain any of that. This is just no. The cartoons I think they are. Well, I hope you're right because then they've got some sort of bullshit answer for Windblade and Arachnid for being in here. But if I'm right, fuck you, IDW. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, I think the, I, they they made such a big uh, emphasis of the fact that there's still 20th century Earth vehicles. I think they're going to – there's going to have some time travel shenanigans. It's going to be wibbly wobbly timey wimey Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, Jeremy, what did you think? I thought it was fun. I, could, I, I know I've seen a number of the Star Trek animated episodes – I can only really remember one where they went into that like negative universe, but I know it was on TV and I've seen them. I just can't remember much of them, but I thought this was fun. The Transformers, I thought pretty much lived up to their, the way that they should be written character wise. And I don't know. I mean, you guys have pretty much talked about all the stuff I was going to bring up. It's the, the tropes are there. It, this is a setup. I think it, it's what a six issue mini, four issue, or four. Sh- okay, so it's it's got to get moving pretty quick because you have the whole plot on this with with this uh, mining facility, but then you have the Klingon plot too. Mm-hmm. But I mean, it's going to be very popcorn, you know, straightforward. But I just think it's going to be a lot of fun. So it's I mean the the art definitely fits the cartoons of both series. The Transformers look like the 80s Transformers. The uh, Star Trek characters look like the animated Star Trek characters. It's a nice mix of both. So, I mean, I- I'm looking forward to seeing the various Star Trek and Autobot interactions in the next is- issue. Get some kind of explanation on why they're there, but in their 80s modes. I don't think Sulu said, oh my, on Star yeah. Trek. It's just been a, <laughs> it's just been his thing it's, ever since Star Trek ended and he's, you know, come right. out of the closet. So you got to take that and, you know, kind of put that in his character for Star Trek now. <laughs> a lot of gimmies here, Yoshi. Also, uh, uh, I also caught the part where Spock uh, says, Hold your fire. I think there's more than meets the eye. There's more to this situation than meets yeah. the eye. <laughs> yeah. That was nice. <laughs> and the Decepticons brought all their air support. Like, all of it. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All the fr- the first three seekers, the Coneheads, um, Arachnid, Acid Storm, Acid Storm. Man, they got all of it. This is they should be destroying this facility. <laughs> like there should be no contest. What's it? Uh, like eight Decepticons against Optimus Prime. There's no chance. Mm-hmm. And it's Kirk who takes them out. Stupid. Yeah, I mean that's 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 my. Uh, I mean, so I I agree. It's it's a you know it's a fun it's a fun book, but. The immediate trope of in the crossover, the good guys, the one good guy takes down the other good guy, uh, because of the confusion. I mean, that's, that's like a, that's a, that's crossover 101. And <laughs> that just, that just took me out of it. And then crossover 102 is the bad guys team up. <laughs> it's got to get moving pretty quick, right? So they get through, through these crossover tropes real quick. Yeah. <laughs> So that was uh, Star Trek versus Transformers number one, and let's move on to Transformers media news. So we've got some news about Respect the Prime, the EP constructed cold. Uh, this is uh, the first limited edition EP in the Respect the Prime series. Each of the six tracks were inspired by stories from Transformers comics. The album will be available at TFCon Chicago from October 26th to 28th and online from distortionprod.com. Proceeds from the album will be donated to cancer research like they always do. It's a great cause. Now we've got a clip. Jeremy, roll the clip. This is from the title track Constructed Cold uh, featuring Red um, Red Locust, which is Jimmer's band. He's He's behind this whole project, so here we go. Anyway, I've listened to it all. Uh, that's a great song. That's, uh, like Jeremy said, mm-hmm. it's called Constructed Cold. And I think that song just kicks. It's fantastic. So yeah. I'm very much looking forward to the rest of the EP. And I'll definitely be buying this at uh, TFCon. Ditto. Yep. Yes. And um, we have been given permission by Jimmers to put the entire full track of that song at the end of the episode. So... Stay tuned to the very end, and you can listen to wow. everything. Jimmer is giving away a sixth of the album for free. <laughs> yeah, he's awesome. I was going to say, but you get you know you get the full high quality, high fidelity stereo on the album. Yeah, of course. It's, it's, yeah, it's, you're, you're going to get a a crappy 64 kilobit version <laughs> yeah. in our episode. <laughs> That's true. All right. Uh, next up, we've got n- news from the Bumblebee movie. Um, apparently, it's getting closer to its release, so they're ramping up the. Uh, the old hype train. Um, we've got some standees, some cardboard standees that are starting to show up at Chilean theaters. Uh, and uh, they look like Bumblebee. Um, also, Haley Steinfeld donated two tickets for the Bumblebee movie premiere uh, and signed some posters for Freeze HD, uh, an auction that, the, that they're holding for that. That was cool of her. We've got new trailer for Bumblebee the movie. Uh, we actually got two trailers, surprisingly enough. Uh, one is the North American trailer, and then we've got the international trailer. Uh, and uh, they're different. Uh, there's a lot of the same footage in, in, in them both, but uh, the international trailer has got uh, a bunch of CG stuff, which is kind of fun. Um, so we're going to talk about... Our- I heard them described as the international trailer has more of the action and the U.S. trailer has more of the yeah. heart. Yeah, that's uh, that's the way I felt about it too. Um, and uh, I think 
uh, personally, between them both, I look at them both as, uh, you know, um, essentially the same thing because they came out at the same time. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really impressed, first of all, with the amount of 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 heart, like we said, like you just said, uh, the amount of heart that is is kept within these uh, within these trailers. There was a lot of discussion during uh, the teaser trailer that it might have been cut to show uh, the entire movie's uh, story and and all the the emotional bits might have been thrown into that one teaser trailer. But now we've got a, a much longer trailer here with a lot more story bits and. It's cute. There's a, a lot of cute fun bits. Uh, I showed it to my daughter and she was cracking up. The, the fun little bits with, with, uh, Bumblebee, uh, kind of trying to get through a house and that was hysterical. <laughs> mm-hmm. She loved it. And then, and then you get into the, the action-y stuff, the stuff that the Transformers movies are, are built on. And it's fast and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's clear. You can tell yeah. <laughs> who's who. <laughs> There's still going to be the argument about whether it's Starscream and Blitzwing. I don't, we don't need to really harp on that. It's, it's a waste of time. They're calling him Blitzwing. Okay. That's fine. Let's, let's deal with that. But it looks like Starscream. Who cares? The fact is, is that the character designs are awesome. I love it. They look fantastic. Drop, kick and shatter. Awesome! They've got a really cool sequence in the in the trailer where they come in in their helicopter modes, they transform into their car modes, and then they transform into their robot modes to meet the army or Sector Seven, I believe it is. And uh, that looked amazing. It looked really good. Um, I'm hoping that uh, there's a little bit more of that because it seems kind of dumb to transform from your helicopters into cars for half a second, then to transform into robots. It seems like a waste of time just for that last bit of transformation, but it works in the, in the trailer. You show your modes. I definitely like the, uh, the CG bits. Now we'll talk about that a lot more, I think, but, um, we get some really, really cool, uh, CG, uh, animation, which, uh, is likely going to be a backstory for, you know, what happened to Bumblebee, where he's come from, that kind of thing. And in it, we see a slew of G1 characters. Very G1-esque designs. My nostalgia is going crazy. Um, just to name a few, we've got Soundwave, Ravage, Shockwave. Optimus Prime is in there. We've got uh, Tetra Jets. Um... Coneheads, and I'm, I'm blanking on other ones here, but it's it looks fabulous. And part of the sequence, you see Soundwave eject Ravage out of his chest, and then he goes running. My daughter caught that one too. She's like, "Is that Ravage?" I said, "Yeah." <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, I'm going to throw it all over to the other guys here and let's get their opinions. Uh, Charles, um, we've got two trailers here. A lot of a lot of good imagery. What do you think? Of course, going into a new live action Transformers movie, you you trying to keep the expectations low. I mean, we've had a pretty bad track record over the last ten years. Yep. But I I'm hyped now after seeing this trailer. I'm I'm hyped for this movie. I I'm excited. I mean, I know I should I should not. Uh, I'm setting myself up for disappointment <laughs> potentially, but I, I'm I'm really excited after seeing what uh, what Travis Knight is doing here. And I mean, I know people are really um, have been really cheering about the uh, the Cybertron scenes, but I think the the Earth scenes are really good too. I mean, I think the most of the action is going to be on Earth. We know that, mm-hmm. and everything we saw in this trailer gave me. Uh, the impression that Travis Knight is trying to tell a really character driven story with the bots as characters. And yes, the humans are still there. They're still human characters and Charlie and Bumblebee, their relationship is really kind of the, the focus of the movie. I'm fine with that. I think that's, uh, it, as long as the Transformers get the focus, I, I think that they're going in the right direction. And I'm, I'm excited to see how this movie turns out now. It is important to remember this is just the first trailer, albeit two, 
The second trailer. Well, the first one was the teaser trailer. What we're seeing here. What does that mean, though? Because the teaser trailer was also two minutes long. Yeah, (laughs) that's not normal. (laughs) So, so we're kind of getting a second full trailer here. But yeah, you're right. It's. I think it's like they realize that they have a lot of goodwill to earn back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, so, yeah, this is the official first trailer. The first one was supposed to be a, like a 30-second or whatever trailer where you barely saw anything. But they gave us two minutes, which was fantastic. Um, but uh, it's important to remember that a tr- movie trailer is a sales vehicle. Um, I'm mm-hmm. not trying to harsh on anyone's buzz here, but these things are designed to sell the movie. So they're cut very well. They're cut, you know, quickly. They're, they're matched to music. They're all the really great scenes. Some of them are, are poached specifically for the trailers. When we say that, Oh, so many cool scenes, such great action, all the CGI, Inside of me, I worry we've seen all the CGI in the entire film. <laughs> um, that's my pessimistic attitude towards the live action movies coming out. I'm worried that all the best stuff has been seen in these, you know, granted three trailers, concluding the, the teaser. But I'm very hopeful myself. Jeremy, what are your thoughts? I was already kind of on the, the positive side of things with this after the first trailer and after um, seeing all the, like all the talk at San Diego um, from Travis Knight and the cast members. And this just confirmed that Travis Knight, I think knows what he's doing. He knows what a transformer is. First of all, and I think he knows what multiple transformers are, except you might not know what Blitzwing is, but that's okay. But that's fine. Cause so many other things here they've done right. I mean, the thing that sold me was this. Where you hear multiple times yeah. throughout the, the trailer. Yeah. I mean, I think you hear the, the Bay version once at the very beginning. But then when you see them transform, you hear that. I'm like, you know, any anyone that's ever watched G1 Transformers, or really any of the animated series, hears that sound and they immediately know you know, what they're mm-hmm. watching. Mm-hmm. And then I've just been going through the the trailers muted here and like pausing at certain places, like the, the quality, like the CG scenes, the quality on these, like the, I'm not going to really describe what's going on here, but like the character, the, the detail on there is you can tell that the, um they're kind of weathered and they've got scratches and it's like, it seemed a little bit more cartoony, watching it in live action, but pausing it, they put a lot of detail into these models. And it's kind of surprising considering that this has much a much smaller budget than the other movies. Mm-hmm. But I think Travis Knight, from his previous history, we know he's a good storyteller. I mean, Kubo and the Two Strings is fantastic. I think we're also, like, his animation background is, is, what's, uh, right. is what's coming to play here. And that, that's what I was about to get to. He, I think it was at Comic Con. He mentioned, like, someone asked him about, like, I think it was mixing, like, anim- uh, the CGI and stuff. And he's like, he just sees all of this as animation because essentially the the all of the Transformers, even on the Earth scenes, they're they're all animation. So he's just like, I, I know how to direct animation, and I think that's really gonna play to his strengths here. Mm-hmm. So I, my main thing is I'm seeing that the Transformers are being treated as characters and not set pieces, and I am excited about that. Yeah. I'm there with you. I I still, for myself, I'm a little bit more pessimistic as to uh, the outcome. I, I, I really want it to be good. It's it, it looks good. I'm hopeful for some decent toys. I want a I want a Starscream or Blitzwing toy, you know. I mean, I'll call it Starscream mm-hmm. when I get it if I, if there is one. Well, just go to Walmart; you can get a, a G one Blitzwing. Yeah, I can. Yeah, that's true. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> the characters look great. There's uh, there's one uh, there's a couple inconsistencies in the in the trailers, but um, like I said, they're uh, they're kind of cut to 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 sell the to sell the movie. 
when uh, when drop kick and, and shatter uh, land and, and turn into cars, they're driving on on one side of each other, and then when they approach from to the uh, sector seven guys, they're on opposite sides of each other. So hopefully there's a cut there, which means that they've been driving for a lot longer. Which or the the it was just flipped in the trailer. Could have been. Yep. Yep. Could have been. I'd I'd like to think that there wasn't. You know, usually if you're gonna drive, you if you have a flight mode, you really you just fly. But whatever. And and the the international trailer, Charlie kind of names Bumblebee. She says, "Oh, you sound like a little bee." Or I sound like a little bumblebee, and that, that, that later on you you get the message from Optimus Prime when uh, she opens them up, and it's this little hologram where uh, where Optimus Prime uh, says Bumblebee, so you have to you have to save the Earth or whatever, which kind of I th- I honestly think that Prime uh, Prime's voice is different for the trailer, um, and that it won't in the movie say Bumblebee there. Because it would be really weird how Charlie comes up with uh, Bumblebee's voice, or sorry, Bumblebee's name, just you know randomly. You know, she actually catches gets his name right. I don't know. That's just something I noticed there. In the so he said Optimus Prime says Bumblebee in the American or in the North American trailer. In the international trailer, he says like B one two seven. That's right. Yes. So I'm just I'm I'm merging those two trailers the two scenes together yeah and I think I think in the international trailer they're using John Bailey for the voice of Optimus Prime I think they it was like placeholder dialogue because in the I'm I'm pretty sure in the North American trailer it's it's Peter Cullen doing the voice I believe so too I don't too, know if yeah. that, that dialogue is final but I think in the international one it's not Peter Cullen it's John Bailey okay at least it it sounds it sounded different to me when I when I listened you know, watching both of them. Yeah. But it is something that I noticed that like, why one would say Bumblebee and the other one would say B-127, right? I, yeah. I honestly think it will be B-127 in the movie. It makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, but if it is Bumblebee, how would Charlie and Optimus come up with the same name? Obviously, Optimus <laughs> would know his name for real. But Charlie, how would she just find, come up with his name, right? That mm-hmm. didn't make sense to me in there. But anyway... Um, well, I mean, also, why would uh, the Optimus Prime hologram that's a, presumably a recording of uh, Optimus's message from Cybertron speak English? You know, he should be speaking well, Cybertronian. I mean, <laughs> you you also have, um, I'm actually looking at where you're seeing the, um, the memory core critical failure message, mm-hmm. and you're seeing it from Bumblebee's perspective. That's all English. Mm-hmm. It's talking about like a kernel version. Um, you know, it's got like all this like stuff that would make sense for us. There's even like a previous and a next <laughs> link mm-hmm. on here. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I like that th- you see here, like you can see his mode is there's a combat disguise. Can't see the next one, but I think th- it, that's kind of neat. Even though it's it's English, I think that that's really neat. Where you're seeing like all of his stats, you can see Energon stores and stuff. That, that's really cool. Mm-hmm. Wow, you did you did a screen by screen? <laughs> no, I, I just it's where I just paused it. I, you know, I can show you a screenshot. <laughs> <laughs> but he's right. It's, I mean, uh, you just kind of pause it there. You do get to see all the little yeah. stuff on there. I mean, they're, they're 1080, uh, 1080p, so yeah, high quality. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing uh, that uh, spe- people have been speculating is that this is why we're getting this War for Cybertron siege line. Is that the Cybertronian mode toys are tying directly into these flashback sequences in the movie. Uh, I totally agree. I think, well, when we see why the, the sound wave was re- reissued for the movie, but yeah, yeah. the, like, some of the, the bigger characters in siege, I think they're going to tie. Sure. In. Yeah. Makes sense. The, um, I mean, it was one of the questions we had when we first heard that the, uh, the, the movie was just going to be a Bumblebee solo movie. Right? How do you produce a toy line for a, a single character movie? Right. You know, so you have flashbacks and you have voice recordings and and video conference calls and stuff like that, right? So yeah, it's uh, that's that's how you do it. So this flashback yes. will produce a, a a really cool toy line. 
Yeah, like all of the Cybertron stuff could be the siege part. Sure. Mm-hmm. I would love to see the uh, the 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 flashback stuff spawn some some direct to video uh movies. Yeah, even just traditional 2D animation. Yeah, that'd be great. They did have plans for a like Cybertron focused Transformers movie back when they thought the last night was still going to be successful. Uh, so maybe there's maybe if Bumblebee is successful they they can revisit that. Yeah. Yeah, so Good job, trailer people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Trailer editors did a great job. <laughs> Hopefully they didn't uh, screw us over and, and, you know, sell us the movie and take all the good parts. <laughs> I, I mean, like I said before, I'm I'm confident in Travis Knight as a filmmaker, even outside of this. I mean, if he was bu- doing just a straight-up action movie, then Bay does have kind of better experience. But if you want... An action movie that has plot and has heart, I think Travis Knight is going to do a great job. Awesome. Well, if nobody else has anything else to say, uh, I guess that will end our discussion on the movies. Uh, Sorry, the movie trailers. We have some stuff for Cyberverse. Um, we, uh, We got some air dates for Australia. Uh, it's going to start airing in Australia on September the 29th, so look for that uh, for our Australian listeners. We've got a premiere date for Eastern Europe of October 27th. You guys got to wait a little longer uh, in Central and Eastern Europe, but it's coming. Uh, no I'm one's sh- waiting. They're just downloading the torrents. I'm sure wherever. you can find it online. <laughs> and we've got some uh, title descriptions for Episodes 9 and 10. If you're eager to know what the titles are going to be, Episode 9 is called Shadow Striker, which is the name of a character. And episode 10 is called McAdams, which is the name of a bar where everyone knows your name. And uh, lastly, uh, Cyberverse is getting put on the Hasbro YouTube channel. This is location locked. So if you're outside of America, you won't be able to watch this. Or get a VPN. Oh, wait, right. You're... DJ Ronan is saying they're not geolocked now. Well, it was when I checked yesterday. Try clicking if, the link. If down, I have learned anything, happens. arguing with DJ Ronan will cause a holy war. Let's just go with it. But I think it is pretty cool that Hasbro is putting them up on the uh, on their YouTube channel the day after they air on Cartoon Network. That will definitely make them more accessible to people, at least in the yes. U.S. <laughs> they, they know Cartoon Network will screw them on the air. Like the time slot. So. Yeah. Oh, DJ Ronan is saying the first three episodes are not locked, but the, the last one is. So maybe they just wait a week to make it globally accessible. Yeah. Oh, thanks. No. Thanks, DJ. That's what I said. <laughs> well, maybe it was it was not geo locked by accident. Yeah. <laughs> they fixed the glitch. <laughs> anyway, if you're if you're able to watch it, watch it on YouTube. Uh if you're not you know what to do because you've been doing it. But that brings us to figuring we we talk to uh, talk amongst ourselves about uh, what we thought of the series so far. We're up to episode four. I have watched all four of them with my daughter because it's a show based on her or targeted to her age bracket. So I wanted to kind of get her her ideas of it. And uh, yeah, I guess uh, we've all kind of watched them so far. So. Um, so Charles, uh, what what do you think of the so the show so far? I'm enjoying it a lot more than I thought I would. I, I you know I think the uh, there I mean I'm the framing device uh, of you know Bumblebee recovering his memories. It's a you know uh, it's getting a little old, but the content inside that framing device I'm really liking. I, I mean the little glimpses we get of Cybertron, all the like. I get the feeling that the people behind this show know Transformers and are familiar with Transformers and have picked some of the best bits of the lore to us to construct the backstory of this show. And I I think there's a lot to like in this show, even though it's a show geared towards kids. They've uh, they've made a show that uh, can appeal to the older fans, too. And then uh, and especially uh, kind of calls back to a lot of the uh 
the stuff from particularly from G1 and G1 and even the comics and even the IDW comics. I think there's a and you know the fact that we get glimpses of uh, of sound wave uh, in one episode, we see uh, we see an Optimus Megatron uh, showdown, you know, for a bit. Uh, the animation I really like. I think it's uh, it's you know really well done. It's very stylized, but I think it it works really well. And uh, seeing some of the cameos on screen, I, I just appreciate. Like uh, I think in the the most recent episode, you see Chromia there. She doesn't say anything, but she's there. Mm-hmm. Chromia and Ratchet are there. In particular, I also liked how episode four was a, a definitely a blatant Star Trek homage with Optimus mm-hmm. Prime as, uh, as uh, you know, Captain Kirk or Captain Picard, or, you know, whoever you think he is. Um, and Picard didn't go on the way mission. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I, I'm enjoying it. So, uh, you know, I, I would prefer half hour shows, but, uh, you know, these little 10 minute, 11 minute episodes are, uh, they're working for me. Mm-hmm. I, I, I watched the, uh, the newest episode for today. And, uh, when they introduced Wheeljack as the, uh, the engineer, which that's his profile, right? Um, mm-hmm. but he gave off much more of a, um, I don't know, uh, uh, like, he, he, it worked for me, but he, um, I think, uh, cause they introduced a lot of characters in this last one. Um, yeah. one of which was Grimlock. Um, and yeah. Grimlock actually gave off more of a ratchet vibe, um, with his, you know, his, his mannerisms and his, his way of speaking. Um, I, I, you know, I expected Grimlock to be a, 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 a gruff, you know, warrior type. And he, you know, he was big and mean in the fight sequence that there was going on. But when he spoke, he spoke very eloquently. And, yeah. uh, <laughs> I was, I'm expecting that to change. At some right. Point. Um, but, uh, but no, I, I, I like some of the character profiles, but I, I was definitely thrown, taken aback by, uh, by Grimlock being, the ratchet character that, uh, that I kind of expected, especially with ratchet on screen. But, uh, but I like it. And I, and I thought Wheeljack was funny as the, as kind of the bumbling engineer that still kind of succeeded in the end, but even though they really didn't want him to Jeremy, what did, uh, what did you think so far? I'm, I'm also enjoying it for what it is. I, I am going in, not expecting transformers prime level of grittiness and just depth of plots and stuff. I know it's going to be a show targeted towards young kids, and I'm just expecting it to be better than the Machinima series. It is by far better than the Machinima <laughs> series. The animation style is, um, it's not the, my favorite, but it's, you know, we've seen much worse, even beyond the Machinima stuff. We've seen much worse in other series that aired on TV. So, it's it's perfectly fine for for what you're doing. I mean, it's kind of the the style that most cartoons are going with these days. The story, uh, yeah. I mean, I'm also kind of like the framing devices. I'm wondering if they're just gonna stick in the little mindscape and not not leave it very often. But I do like some of the stuff that they're introducing, um, like Grimlock being intelligent. You know, we've seen him be dumb pretty much the entirety of the character's existence. Even in the Robots in the Sky series, he was not the smartest, the smartest member of the team. I'm thinking they're going to do something further down the line where something happens. Maybe when he comes out of stasis, he's lost his intelligence. The voice acting is really kind of where I have an issue with the show. It's not the best. Mm. I mean, there, there's some of them that are okay. Um, the guy doing Prime is doing his best Peter Cohen impression, and I would rather have a different take. I mean, like we have in previous series with the first Robots in the Skies or, um, what, like, um, Armada, like the Unicron trilogy, um, animated. They all had their own takes on Optimus Prime. They were not trying to do Peter Cohen. Now, I, I wish this would have done the same, but, I don't know. The, I think as the series goes on, the characters or the actors are going to kind of find their grooves with the characters and it'll probably improve 
most series do. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's definitely um, not a show I hate, which is, That's good. you know, probably mm-hmm. high praise. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I think maybe the mission of the series was kind of to help lower our expectations. The... Um the frame, the framing device of the Mindscape was was quite good, and, and to back up your point a bit, this most re- recent episode, I don't think they left it at all. Um, they right. spent that whole episode in it. One thing about the episodes, recent Transformers shows uh, have been very uh, story driven, as far as like they're not episodic. This is an extremely episodic show. Oh yes, where the eleven minute time lot is uh is used exceedingly well so that even if a if a, a viewer is just tuning in for the first time they don't need they're not being dropped in the middle of a storyline right they're they're getting a, a really quick and dirty story and that's it and if they don't watch for another two months then they're getting another quick and dirty story and that's it mm-hmm. and they're still they're not missing out on anything really because the the stories don't really line up all that much. Um, I mean, right. Well, and really, so far, outside of the first couple episodes, it's all been pretty much in the mindscape. That's right. So it would make it easy to just pop in and out, get a random episode. So I think that that having a young kid that likes to watch the same episode of a show over and over, Mm -hmm. I think that's a good way to go. No, that's been very good. And they do, and it's layered so that the episodes they are self-contained, but you can also assemble them to to into a coherent whole. Like you can, even though they're out of order, like the I think the, the second episode they show, um, or the third episode they show the the fight for the Allspark and the Allspark getting thrown out into the space bridge, and then the second episode they showed Bumblebee leaving on the Ark to look for the Allspark. So you know that takes place after the third episode Mm -hmm. and then the fourth episode takes place after the second episode because they're already in space looking for the all spark it would be a neat project to uh to see once the series is done to go out and clip out all the actual you know the the memory sequences and mm -hmm. and actually assemble the show in order it was supposed to be Mm -hmm. just to see how how coherent the 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 memory sequences were Mm -hmm. uh yoshi what uh You've watched episode one to four, I assume, and what uh, what are your thoughts so far? Well, I'm concerned that the show is talking down to kids. Whenever they, they seem to get into anything technical, I really feel like they're dumbing down the conversation to the point that this show is targeted to such a small age gap that anybody outside of it is not going to give a shit about it. Okay. Uh, um. I, I didn't quite, and, and maybe I wasn't paying close enough attention, but I didn't quite get the urgency described in the show over why they have to protect the Allspark so desperately. That was the whole plot of episode three. I I, I, I must have missed the key word that that is at at one point. Bumblebee said that when he when the Allspark talked to him, he he felt that there was infinite life inside of it. All, the AllSpark is basically the power source of Cybertron, and so they had to keep it out of Megatron's hands, but if they send it out of, away from Cybertron, Cybertron will die, because it doesn't have its power source anymore. Okay. Just two more things. I love whoever's doing Starscream's voice. I, I think I think Starscream's got a great voice for this, for the, for the version that they're portraying here. And I think they couldn't have picked a more pompous, egotistical person to do Prime. The fact that they let him get away with saying Teletron without correcting him or forcing him to say the fucking word right is... its it, They should be embarrassed, because every other character on the show can say the word except him. And it's... its We're going to have a generation of people fighting over how to say Teletron now, uh, just like we got people arguing over if, it, if it's pronounced GIF or GIF. It's... It, it, well, it's been going on since Beast Wars, really. No. They did the same I thing. Th- I think I think you're maybe exaggerating the importance of that a tiny bit. <laughs> what kid, what child it's, is going to argue with the way the leader of the Autobots is pronouncing Teletran? I I don't think it matters. I really okay. don't think, say, an O and or an A is that big an issue. It's an O or two A's. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
I'm just saying, one person is not sounding like everybody else on the show, and it wasn't corrected. I, I just, that, to me, boggles my mind. You can screw its importance, just for the show's continuity. Like, why doesn't everybody pronounce that word the same? I mean, he's... Said, he's like the one guy in school that everyone's just making fun of, because he can't... He's not... He's refusing he, to say the word correctly. People people have accents and, and say things differently all the time throughout the, the human population. I don't think pronouncing a word with a tiny difference is that big a deal or is going to influence a generate a generation of children will not be able to say teletran i think you're exaggerating the the importance a tiny bit more than a tiny bit you don't like what i have to say sir so let's move on i'm just saying i don't think it's that important right i agree with you <laughs> I wish that we had enough shares in the podcast for that to mean something, Jeremy. <laughs> I just think it's not, I don't think that's a, that, that, uh. So when he says that, Teletron for the first time, you don't raise your eyebrow and think, did he, did he say that wrong? It didn't, it didn't pull you he, out of the fucking show for two seconds to be like, Man, that was weird. And then you're waiting for him to say it again. You're just standing on your fucking uh, toes, <laughs> waiting to see if you re you really did hear it right, instead of paying attention to the fucking show. Okay, Yoshi, I'm not in your head, so that didn't happen to me. I'm no, sorry. No, no, I said you didn't do that. I said <laughs> no, that's what I, was, I oh. didn't. All right. It, uh, and just to back up, Yoshi, is this listed as an animation and technical error on the TF Wiki? Okay. And it, it does say Bumblebee pronounces it right. Anyway, if we're done with this, let's move on to transforming pop culture. Um, apparently now you can get officially licensed Chinese generations branded <laughs> Netgear routers. So this is a router made by Netgear and it's, uh, it's got Optimus Prime on the box and an Autobot logo. There you go. It's officially licensed. Hey, look at that. It's 2.4 gigahertz to 5 gigahertz um, for gaming. Whatever. It's It looks like it's a good router. But, yeah, they're using the officially licensed. It's it's all licensed with the Transformers logo there. It's, uh, it's pretty cool. I don't know whether having Transformers stuff on my networking equipment is important to me. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I I would not buy a Netgear? Chinese branded router. That's <laughs> just me. It I would not buy any Chinese branded router. I I would wait for a US release of this. I'm just kind of paranoid about anything the Chinese Some government people put tape over their cameras, Daryl. Other people Aren't they don't, all other made people in don't China? Tech from China. <laughs> but made in China for release oh, in China, the Chinese government has more control over that. Whatever. Anyway, this is funny. It's a neat thing. So anyway, yeah, they missed an opportunity to oh. do a, a classic tech spec thing on the back. Yeah. I think that would have been awesome. I'm on your it's side. It's an 802.11 AC router, if that matters to all the uh, net net heads out there. I mean, I'm, I'm sure this is but a yeah. perfectly good router. And, you know. Anyway, that's it for uh, pop culture. All right, let's uh, move on to some convention news. Right. Uh, in convention news, we have an announcement from TFCon Chicago. Uh, Transformers artist Ken Christensen is going to be attending. He has done uh, video game concept art. He's done covers for a number of IDW comics. And also he's been involved in toy development for uh, various Hasbro brands, including Transformers, Star Wars, and more. I think Charles and I both got a chance to meet him at a previous TFCon USA. He's a nice guy. Um, mm -hmm. He's got prints. I'm sure uh, he's going to be doing commissions as well. So you know, be sure to meet him at the show. The next thing we have, um, last week when I gave a list of New York Comic Con Transformers artists, apparently I missed a number of them. I was apparently only looking at a specific promoted guest page or, or something, I'm not sure, but there was a, a larger guest page for everyone in Artist Alley, so would like to give the full list. Uh, last week I mentioned Andrew Griffith, Nick Roach, Corn Howell, and Livio Remindelli, but also attending are Alex Milne, Brendan Cahill, 
Dan Canna, Brian Shear, and uh, not really a Transformers artist, but Larry Hama, um, you know, who does the G.I. Joe comic that has been going on since forever. Mm -hmm. IDW is continuing. Uh, he's also going to be there. So sorry for leaving off um, your guys' names. I just I looked in the one place that was obvious to look, and I didn't realize there was you more didn't care on that. <laughs> if if I didn't care, I wouldn't have put this in, you know, at all. Because I thought this was just a, a good idea to include, and <laughs> I'm just not good at digging up the information. So as, as as Alex said on Twitter, you need to do deeper research. <laughs> yes, go deeper. Alex raked you over the goals, man. <laughs> when you, it's it's really Charles's fault. It is because he, he wasn't on the show. I wasn't here. <laughs> yeah, you know, you, you try to do a nice thing, and you know, just, well, I'll I'll, I'll try to be here years. in the future. <laughs> yes, do that. No more work trips for you. <laughs> All right. Well, that's it for convention news. All right, and we will. Finish up the show here. Uh, again, not a lot of feedback this week. Uh, so if you do want to leave us feedback, uh, you can contact us. Uh, you can leave us a voicemail. You can send us email. You can do all that at transmissionspodcast.com slash feedback. Also, we're all on all over social media, so you can contact us there. And uh, you're we're on Discord. Uh, you can join our Discord and chat with us whenever. So... I think Yoshi says all that in the in the outro too. So <laughs> I think we'll leave it there. Thanks everyone for listening. We'll see you next time. Bye bye. Bye. Teletron out. Later. Thanks for listening to Transmissions. Remember, you can help support the show by donating to us directly via Patreon or PayPal. Once you become a donor, you will receive access to donor only goodies like donor only contests listening to us record transmissions live and getting transmission swag at 20% off. You can find links for this at transmissionspodcast.com slash support. Subscribing to us on Stitcher, iTunes, and Google Play is also a great way to support us here at Transmissions. Every subscription we get helps us get better noticed on those services. Leaving us a comment and five-star review doesn't hurt either. Be sure to come chat with us on Discord. You will find a link for Discord at transmissionspodcast.com slash Discord. And of course, you can always send us an email at feedback at transmissionspodcast.com. Thank you all for listening, and we'll see you again next week. Both Jeremy and I are subscribed to his Patreon to, you know, to keep that going, so... That's great. I'm actually not right now. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, no, actually, no, wait, I, I, I am. I forgot. I subscribe for the wiki stuff. So, yeah, I'm just not at the level where I get in the credits like some people. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Mike, I hope you can do something with that, with that entire section. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. So the voice actor also says experiments. When he talks about experiments, he says experiments. That's also a mispronunciation. He should be beaten within an inch of his <laughs> life. <laughs> and my daughter did not catch it. She's gonna grow up saying Teletron, <laughs> and you know, I know she's, it's she, terrible. She's gonna be one, she's gonna be one of the generation of the lost who only knows as as, as Teletron. Five years, you fucking guys. Five years. <laughs> <laughs> the last part of your application just as formality really just what's this <laughs> word right here teletron <laughs> sorry okay we can't hire you you are an idiot <laughs> <laughs> let's move on to convention news oh we're not doing transforming pop culture oh yeah let's let's move on to transforming pop culture Careful, Yoshi. Charles is going to try something clever. Yeah. <laughs> I'll give you three guesses, Yoshi, what it's going to be. You only need one. <laughs> I'm not it's, worried it's about it. It's pretty obvious. It's pretty <laughs> obvious. <laughs> we, it is being added in. I, I thought our, 
I guess the idea was still being tossed around that it was. You're the one that that kind of inferred that it would be added in when you were recording the show last night. Oh, I you, did too. You actually, I, you tweeted about it and said it would go into alt mode. When you I tweeted did. About it. Yeah, I mean, yes, I did. <laughs> you kind of made that executive decision. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. I was feeling the power of of a hundred percent majority share at the time. I guess. <laughs> wow. It was just you were on your moderation high. I was. <laughs> You're like I got all I the have power. All, all, all encompassing power. Yes. <laughs> all right. Optimus drives to Autobot fleet. To Cybertron. That is my final command. 